cultivate fruitfulness in the lives of the believers of his church. And, and that is, is the, the dead center theme of the first three chapters of the book of the Revelation. The book of the Revelation was given to God's servants. That means given to the people in Christ's church, given to us as well as every succeeding generation past us and all preceding generations back to the time of the cross. And Jesus Christ is explaining his mode of operation, if you want to call it that, uh, his method of ensuring that each generation of Christ's church is fruitful for God. Now remember, God is a farmer. Did you know that? In fact, the Bible even defines what kind of farmer he is, both in the Old Testament in Isaiah and in one of the longest presentations of God's ministry in the New Testament, John 15. Jesus said, my father is the vine dresser. You know, I said in first service, I think that means he lives in Lawton, you know? Not sure, but you know, there's a lot of vines out there, but you know, I'm teasing. But, but actually, God is seen to be a cultivating farmer. And then Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we're God's field. So when you think about it, all of our Christian lives are all about us being a field that the Lord came and purchased at immense price, his own blood. And that field, he didn't purchase for it to sit there and grow weeds. Right? He purchased it to cultivate and to plant and water, and in his perfect time, harvest a crop. Wow. Did you know that if you're a truly born-again Christian this morning, God is very much interested in farming your life. And he describes how he does that right here in Revelation 1, and this morning we're in 2, and later on we'll be in 3. You know, God is much like the farmers that are all around us and the many gardeners that are within us. I, I don't know if you've noticed, if you get outside of the city very far of Kalamazoo, you notice outlying fields are just going. And, and I watch them all, you know, because it's, you know, uh, 15 miles of fields that I drive by coming in. And I, I love watching how they turn them over the big turnover and then they, they do the finer work and then they do the really fine work and then they get the big sprayers out, I don't know what they're spraying on there, kill something or fertilize or something, and then all of a sudden the little planter goes and one of the fields is already about this high. Now that's intentional. There are other fields that are, look like wasteland and trees are growing in them. And so obviously they're not being farmed. But God says, I bought you to be my field to farm you. And so, Jesus desires from every member of his body a life that is plowed, that is planted, that is watered, that is weeded, and that eventually produces a harvest. Now, for you to understand, lest I unnecessarily offend anyone, that the Bible presents this gathering as a gathering of born-again, vibrant believers that are to be challenged and nurtured to deepen that life. Now, there's nothing wrong with unsaved people coming in. The Apostle Paul says, if an unbeliever happened to come into a church service, they'd probably think we're all crazy. But this is a gathering of believers that are being reminded of why we even are alive today, what our purpose is. It's all written down. And so when we gather, there are many things that we look at that we check off in our mind and say, yep, I know that. And other things that say, ooh, I didn't know that. I'm going to check if that's really in the Bible. And other things we go, ooh, that hurt. And other things we go, wow, I can't wait to do that. And so there's just all different ways that we are this morning. But the underlying truth is, as long as we're in Revelation, this was written to God's servants. And we happen to be the piece of the gathered servants of God this morning. And we were not, this is not like a football game where, where we have the highly paid, highly trained, highly uh, gifted professionals up here and that all of you are the spectators eating the popcorn and kind of commenting and clicking, texting and, you know, enjoying the show. All of us, God is desiring to be plowing and planting in every life. And so this message from Christ is 
utterly vital to your spiritual life. This is not click it off, I went to church, I got my bullet to tell my pastor, I'm on vacation, you know, I was there. This is life or death. This is real. And I hope you realize that when we come before the Lord. Jesus sends us a description in these three chapters, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, of how he prepares, how he cultivates the lives of those in his church. This is for believers. Church is for believers. Church was never designed for unbelievers. It's okay if they come. We hope they get saved. It's not for unbelievers. And unbelievers should always feel uncomfortable here. Always. That's how it's designed by God. They think we're crazy. The preaching of the cross is those that perish foolishness. It is ridiculous what we talk about if you're not connected to Christ. But as we've been seeing, these three chapters are dominated by God's desire to see us fruitful. That desire is explained and described. In fact, what the Lord does to help us understand, he picks seven churches that are representative of all churches on the earth at that moment and all churches that would ever exist throughout all the time of the existence of Christ's church on the earth. And he picks those seven to represent all. And from the seven... Five of them don't pass muster. It's almost like, you know, the military called out of the barracks, you know, they whistle or whatever they do, and they all come up, and they're supposed to line up, and the the officer inspects them, and he checks, you know, if this is tight and if this is right. And when Jesus mustered the seven churches, five of them didn't pass. And so he uses those five as an object lesson for us. Well, it was really for them because they were alive and Jesus dictated. In fact, this is the only part of the Bible that Jesus personally dictated. This, this is not normal inspiration where, where the Spirit of God speaks through his holy prophets and apostles and they write down with their own personality coming through the inspired words of God. This is dictation. Inspiration is not dictation. This is inspired dictation. Jesus chose every word, chose every recipient. This was seven. It's like sitting behind a desk, calling in a stenographer and saying, take seven letters for me. And Jesus sits there and boom, 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 seven. He dictates to a specific group of people. He says, five of you didn't pass muster. Can you imagine living in a church in Thyatira, in Pergamos, in Ephesus, and having a courier come and and to read this, that John was on an island and John was in the spirit and John turned around and John, they knew who John was. John was a pastor in Ephesus. John was the last living apostle. And they said, and John says, I saw Jesus Christ. I haven't seen him since the resurrection and the 40 days after. And he wrote a letter and I wrote it down. He dictated it and it's for you. You guys better really read this. It's about you. He doesn't like what he saw. I mean, those people were stunned. And do you know what is amazing? He's, he's, he has looked down throughout all the ages and he knew that these same characteristics would always be present in his church. So this morning, as we go through this, It's like you just were rudely awakened at 3.30 or 4 a.m. in your barracks and you were dressed and run out in the cold and you're standing there and the Lord's walking by and he's going, hmm, your gun's (laughs) upside down. You don't have any bullets. Where's your helmet? You understand what I mean? He's, He's going through and he's saying, you need to fix it. And did you know if he points it out, it isn't an exercise in futility. If he says we're supposed to have something, he's provided it. And it's our choice to either respond or not respond. So to be fruitfully bringing glory to God from our lives, the Lord says that we need to be healthy. Uh, the Lord measures our health basically in four areas. In fact, if you look in Acts 2, at the end of the second chapter, it says that the early church was involved in worship, constantly in instruction, in fellowship, and they were expressing their faith through through ministry. And those four areas have always marked the church. Uh, Worship, instruction, and fellowship, and and evangelism, and expressing the love of Christ. And so it's kind of like uh, your car. If it's not running, um, in the olden days, they used to just lift the hood. 
and someone would look underneath and they tinker with it. Now, they rarely lift the hood to tinker. It has a little jack and they go and they put a little cable on there and this machine looks at every everything. It looks at all those computer chips and, and, and it knows how many hours this has done that and it's a diagnostic. I remember uh, that I'm very mechanical and I remember once fixing my own car once in 1973 I fixed my car once no one's ever let me back in fact yesterday I was talking to someone that was helping us with something and I said hun I said sir I don't even know where the water goes in the lawnmower and he smiled he says you don't you know uh, he says you are totally non-mechanical he was helping me fix something at the house but I was going to during the Arab oil embargo which may happen again someday do you remember when there were lines here in Michigan and I was this junior in high school in 73 and I had this 450 or 60 or 70 cubic inch caprice that was such a huge powerful eight-cylinder motor that when I would rev my motor the car would rise I don't know if it was the fan or what but it just it just went up and down it was so ready to go but when the gas went up, and I couldn't afford it, it went from 19 cents to 79 or whatever it went. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember, I went to the library and researched what I could do. And I found out that four-cylinder cars were much more fuel efficient than eight-cylinder cars. And so I lifted the hood, took my dad's tool, undid four spark plugs, and I had a four-cylinder Caprice. It was the first four-cylinder Chevy had ever produced. And what I didn't know is that, that they fire like one, eight, two, six. You know, there's some sequence there that, uh, and so mine wouldn't even move. <laughs> My four cylinder car, it just shook. It just, and it misfired, and it, it, it really, and you know what? I took it in, and they lifted the hood, and the diagnostic was the man said, oh. He said, Someone, someone's tried to hurt you. He says, They undid the spark plugs, and he went, Ugh. and it ran perfectly. Did you know that the Lord wants to lift the hood of our lives and do a diagnostic? So here, here are four diagnostics that the Lord uses to reveal our spiritual health and fruitfulness. And this morning, we each need to just pull in and let the Lord plug in the cable and do a diagnostic and check our spiritual health and check how prepared our lives are to bear fruit. And remember, the healthier we are, according to the guide, According to his word, according to the God who doesn't change, who is immutable, he always desires the same things. What he desired from the first century church, he desires from us today and forever. Because he doesn't change. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't say, whoop, don't mean that anymore. Whoop, sorry, made a mistake. Let me rephrase that. Back the tape up. Edit that out. No, this is his desire. So what are these diagnostic areas? Well, number one, the first one is a worship diagnostic. And, and what I want you to think about is, now remember, I'm talking about what God says his purpose, ideal purpose is for the church. All of us are at different stages. We all fall short. We all fail. We all, but this is what God wants. This morning, do you feel excited to be here at church? Do you feel close to the Lord? Do you have a heart tuned in and already filled with spirit-prompted worship that's, that has just flowed through your personal week, that has, has issued from your personal time in the Word, that just comes out, that you find yourself singing and humming and songs from the choir and choruses you've learned and your personal worship repertoire that you use and that sometimes you just sit there watching the sunset or the sunrise or the thunderstorm and you just break into how great the Lord is and you just roll into here as a part of that and you're already quite excited about the Lord and you're just so thrilled that you're coming to the gathered church or that's by the way is what the Lord wants that's his plan that's in the manual or do you feel distant these days from all of that do you kind of feel far away from God you kind of feel that way all week, all month. In fact, you can't remember when you felt close to the Lord. Now, I remember, and I told the first service this, I remember 
right after I got here, I hadn't been fully Michiganized, and uh, I made a big mistake. Now, I make lots of mistakes all the time. It's just most of you don't notice it or realize it or whatever, but I made a huge public mistake. In my zeal, at communion, thinking of what Christ expects and desires and loves and longs for us to do, I remember saying, okay, you're all going to stand up, and why don't you all just turn to each other and just share about the greatest day in your life, how you got saved. Oh, did I get in trouble. I, because it was just an overflow, a cascade of, of emails, and people said, they actually said, if you ever do that again, I will never come back to that church. I will not go to a place where someone turns and asks me if I'm a Christian. I can't believe that you would ask such a thing. I thought, if you can't ask it in a worship service at communion, when could you ever ask that question? Churches for believers, communion is certainly only for born-again believers who have confessed and forsaken and cleansed. So, you know, I... Ooh, backed off from that and I still do it surreptitiously like on the back of your name tag you know do you remember all these things we've done and and work on your 15 second testimony but I found out you can't directly confront people nowadays even though we're supposed to come here full and overflowing so do the worship diagnostic secondly how about the fellowship diagnostic do you love to meet with other believers and share what God is doing in each other's lives? I mean, you just can't wait to see them because you've been praying for them and longing over them and they've been praying for you and they miss you when you're not here. And you come and you say, hey, where have you been in the Word this week and have you been able to witness to someone and, and how are you doing with that area we're praying about where you struggle? Is that, is that how it is? I mean, when you're pulling in the parking lot, I mean, you're just moving your car. You're hoping you can get so you can cross the paths of as many people as possible. Or... Can you hardly remember the last time that you actually saw the Lord at work in your life that you could even share about and you feel far from peace and joy and victory and blessing? In fact, you secretly hope that you can slip in and out of here with no one getting close enough to you this morning to even ask you anything personal while you're here. In fact, you have worked it out. You know which door to park by and you know when to come so that you can right to your seat and sit in such a way you position yourself and spread stuff around on the pew so no one gets close to you and, you know, act like you're coughing when they come toward you and, and you even know how to leave in time that no one talks to you other than, hey, how you doing? Great, good to see you, you know. Now, in the worship and in the fellowship, can you tell by the way I presented them which one is the one that God says is the field that produces fruit and which one needs plowing or something? Can you tell? How about the third diagnostic, uh, the, the devotional diagnostic? Can you hardly wait to get started in our study of God's word this morning? I mean, do you feel the same way you feel every day of the week in your personal devotions? It's kind of like the highlight of your day. You can't believe you get an appointment with God and that he is actually waiting for you when you get there and that, that he actually is going to talk to you. And even if you're in the same, like I have a friend of mine who's always in Romans. I mean, he just can't get out of Romans. It's because every day it's new and alive and fresh. And it's just like, it's like the first time you read it and there's... It's just knowing God. And, and that's how your devotional life is. It doesn't matter where you read. It doesn't matter where you open. It's just like better than eating. It's your daily bread. Or, does your Bible feel about as heavy as those cement blocks that I was lugging around yesterday? I had to move our beehive to a new location because they're moving the horses in. I don't want the horses eating my honey, so I had to move it. And boy, the older I get, cement blocks just seem heavier. I mean, I think they put more cement in them or something, you know? Or I have less cement or something. But, you know, it's just, is that how the Bible feels to you? It's kind of like, oh, 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 you know? And, and you used to find that you took it everywhere and marked and had papers in it and you were always writing. And, and now, you know, you don't even take it on vacation. You don't take it to work. You don't take it to school. In fact, you don't take it anywhere. It's not even on your desk anymore. Is that how the Bible feels like lead? How about a ministry diagnostic, a fourth one? 
are you a conscious investor in ministry? Do you look for more ways to use your time and spiritual gifts to serve the Lord? I mean, are you, are you kind of like thinking about, wow, I only have you know, so many thousand days left if I leave, leave, live the normal life expectancy on earth. And I've, in those thousands, however many I have left, I want to know the Lord this well. I want to share with this many people. I'd love to, to go and serve in this way. And I'd love to consciously get to the place where I can invest more and more and more in Christ church. Are you, a, are you looking at Christ church as the greatest thing in the universe and you're a part of it and it's what God's doing and you can't believe that, that you get to be in it? Or, when you hear a challenge that you should jump in and serve and speak up for Christ, it kind of bothers you a little bit. Like, uh, quit harping on that. Do you sometimes wonder if you'll even get any reward in heaven? In fact, you come to the place where you just hope you make it because you just feel so out of touch? Has the zeal you once knew dried up and become a far-off memory, kind of like playing on the playground? I remember hanging on the monkey bars upside down in kindergarten at Hazlitt, wherever that was. Boy, that was like eons ago. I don't know if I've ever hung upside down since, and the little girl let go and she fell on her head. And I've never fallen, I've never hung upside down again because my little friend whammed. And I've always thought that's not a good thing. But boy, that was a long time ago. Is that how long ago it seems like ministry and the Lord and the Word and the worship and the fellowship was vibrant? Well, if these or a myriad of other telltale signs of spiritual listlessness and barrenness have cast their shadow across your field, then Jesus Christ invites you in Revelation 1, 2, and 3 to let him cultivate fruitfulness in your life. Jesus applies these truths that I just talked about to churches just like ours. Remember the seven? They represent Calvary Bible Church and every church throughout all the centuries that has had the Word of God as the center purpose driving everything they do, everything they teach, everything that they believe and their philosophy. It's a word. You know, we're not supposed to build on the Word of God. We're supposed to actually build under the Word of God and not get get away from it. A lot of churches kind of build on the word. It's kind of there, but you don't notice it anymore. It's just they've got all this. It's supposed to stay under the boundaries of God, his word, his doctrine, his truth. So we see, if we look at the seven churches, that five of the seven churches lacked the key areas that brought them fruitfulness. And, and so we began looking at this uh, two weeks ago. In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus lists the areas that were keeping those believers and their local churches from being fruitful for him in their lives. Now, it was very painful in the first century because he was writing to a, a geographically recognizable local group of people. If you would have gotten on a Roman road and went to Pergamos, you would have found them. They were identifiable group. And Jesus says, you're not passing muster. So Jesus writes to them. And remember that by the time Jesus was writing to these churches, they'd already heard the message of the apostles. They had Paul's epistles, a lot of them. They had, were slowly getting copies of the Gospels. And of course, they had Christ's Bible, the Old Testament, the Septuagint. So these people basically were just about as exposed to God's word as we are, plus the fact that most of them had met some of the authors, which we haven't. You know, we have our, you know, like our 92-year-old Billy Graham, who is a Christian superstar. But they had Peter. They had John. They had met Paul. And so these people were really exposed. So Jesus writes to these seven churches, individual letters, and what he says is, I hold these churches responsible to live what I sent in my word through my apostles and prophets. The clear message Christ gives us is each believer has a personal responsibility to know and obey what's in God's Word. Now, you know what? You can be wheeling down 94 at 92 miles an hour or 89 or whatever, and, and a policeman can pull you over and you can put your window down. Is this a state you're supposed to get out of the car or you're supposed to stay in? 
you know, I've lived so many places, you always have to check. I can't remember. I haven't been pulled over. Probably will be today. But I haven't been pulled over in so many years, I don't know. But, but I remember when we lived in Oklahoma, you're supposed to stand right by the car. Get right out and, I, and stand there like this, you know, hands away. In New England, I think you were supposed to stand by your door. I don't know what we have here. But if you got pulled over and the policeman said, you're going 89, you can't say, oh, I didn't know what the speed limit was. Because if you have a driver's license, you went through that course and there's that nice little Michigan driver education book that you had to sign that you read and you had to take a test and part of what you signed is that you're responsible for all those funny shaped signs and the different colors and what all those little symbols mean and the speed limits. So it doesn't matter if I don't know what the speed limit is on I-94. You're responsible. And God says, it doesn't matter if you didn't listen in church. It doesn't matter if you don't like to read. It doesn't matter if you didn't grow up in a Christian home. When you are born again, you are to be a receiver of the engrafted word. And it's supposed to become something that you can't live without. And that you long to know what God wants. Because you love him so much. Fruitfulness for God is always tied to receiving and acting upon his word. And if you're sporadic in the word, you'll be sporadic in fruit bearing for the Lord. The key is to live by a daily application of the Lord through his word. It's not just to sit here. It's not to listen on the radio. It's not to be online. It's, it's to be actually face to face with God. Face time. Actually see him. Hear him through his word. The word is a meeting point. The key is, is not just to be in the word. It's the start. It's the tool. You know what? It's, it's fine to carry around a communication device. But if it's never on and used, it's just a weight in the pocket. The purpose of this is not to hold papers from blowing. The purpose is to communicate. It's, it's a vehicle. And just turning it on doesn't count. It's actually getting someone at the other end that you send the text to or you see or you hear. That's what the Bible is. It's a meeting point. It's the start of closeness with the Lord. So how does Jesus cultivate fruitfulness in the lives of believers? Well, we've seen that he lists five areas, and, and I want to remind you of these. To please God and be fruitful, each of us need to decide whether we really want what these five churches were told by Christ that they needed. Number one, Ephesus was told you need to love Jesus most. And then Pergamos, you need to separate from sin. And then as we'll see in Thyatira today, you need to unfriend worldliness. You need to make a conscious choice somehow worldliness came in and got in your feed but you need and in your list of friends but you need to check off and unfriend or worldliness got your email address and you need to block that worldliness is spam worse than spam it's a toxic malicious virus that will corrupt your hard drive it'll erase everything about god and you need to unfriend worldliness. That's what Thyatira was told. You need to overflow the Spirit, the Lord said to Sardis, and you need to live the crucified life, he said to Laodicea. And we already started looking at these expectations, so now Revelation 2 is where you are. Look at verse 4 with me, because in Revelation 2 verse 4 we saw the first truth. Jesus said, my first and greatest expectation of you is this, to please God and to be fruitful, love Jesus most. Look at what he says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. The saints in Ephesus were not being obedient to the central truth of the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. Love the Lord your God most. All your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Now, I'm glad I didn't write that. That is impossible to do. I'm glad that isn't what our church has cooked up as one of our rules. This is in the driving manual when you got your license. And this is the expectation of the owner of the field who went and purchased us, Hebrews 13 says, with his own blood. I mean, he didn't use his coffee money to buy us, you know, kind of discretionary spending. He paid everything to purchase us. And the first fruit first crop he wants to see growing in our lives is 
love Jesus most? Well, the problem is their lives were clogged with so many other things. Jesus was no longer first in their hearts. Do you know what? And, and we're going to look at Ephesus in particular historically someday in the future. But do you know what they were doing? They were doing all the right things for the wrong reason. Did you know that? They were busy. They were in church. They were singing and teaching. And, and they were tired. They were, it seems like they were always at the church. They were doing it all for the wrong reason not out of a consuming love. You know, I, I can go home after a long day and find Bonnie up to her neck with work and I can <sighs> dutifully say, wish she'd get more done, but I'll take the trash out. Wish she'd get more done, I'll pick up all my dirty clothes on the floor. I wish she'd get more done, but you know, I'll pick up all the junk I left by my chair last night. You know, I can do that. I can do the right things. Take the trash out, pick up, for all the wrong reasons. Or I can love her so much that I would do anything that would please her. Which field do you think the Lord grows fruit in? The ones who do all the right things for the wrong reasons? No. Jesus says, I have this against you. Look at verse 5. Remember where you've fallen. Remember why you're supposed to do what you're doing. And repent and, and do the first works, verse 5 of Revelation 2, or else I'll come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. See, collectively, churches have eras and times of blessing and ministry. You can look across the world. There are churches that become a lampstand for the Lord, and they radiate out, as it says, the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, that everywhere what God was doing was heard of in that church. Do you ever hear of the church in Thessalonica anymore? Mm -mm. How about Ephesus? Mm -mm. Their time passed. Why? Because God lessened? Because mm -mm. he wasn't powerful enough? Because mm -mm. they didn't do it. Look at what verse 5 says. I will remove your church, your lampstand, from being the lampstand of Ephesus, from its place, unless you repent. What is repentance? A change of my mind, how I believe about something that changes my behavior. He said, I want you to, to reprogram why you're in church, why you read your Bible, why you give, why you pray, why you serve. If it's not because you love me more than anything else, I don't want all that stuff. I'll find someone else that loves me with all their heart, and I will start working through them. Well, these clogged people, Jesus said, stop everything else from pushing me out. Go back to your original settings. Love me with all you are. Now look at verse 12 of chapter 2, because to please God and be fruitful, the second church, Pergamos, heard this. The only way you can please God and be fruitful is separate from sin. The saints in Pergamos were not being obedient. Verse 14, uh, move down from 12 to 14. I have a few things against you. You have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. You also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The problem was they weren't being obedient to the clear word of God. And we saw this last time. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. The Lord says, I will dwell with you and walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. Therefore, come out and be separate. The Lord says, the only way you please me is loving me so much, that's the first one, that number two, you love me so much, no, notice what it says, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, don't even touch what is unclean. Don't touch it. It's, he didn't say don't participate, he says don't even touch it. You know, I heard an elder prayer this morning, one of the men was talking about, he says, did you know that there's a rise of a lot of diseases in America? One thing that's coming up now is Leprosy is starting to come back. And they said leprosy is carried by armadillos, and people are so fascinated with armadillos, and they, they play with them when, when they find them in roadkill, and, you know, you can go to armadillo roadkill cafes and everything. It's kind of funny. And armadillos carry leprosy. Don't touch them. And don't, don't encourage them to be around. You know what? Sin is so bad. The Lord says, don't touch it. And he says, if, if you agree to separate from sin... We saw last week, I will be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters. Therefore, having these promises, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
He said, either do it for love or do it for fear or do it because you love me so much that you fear any displeasure from me, but don't touch what, what I say is unclean. Now, to this morning. Look at verse 18 of chapter 2. Because here's Christ's third expectation. First expectation, love Jesus most. Second, don't touch sin. Separate from sin. Here's number three. Unfriend worldliness. See what it says in verse 18? The angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. Verse 19, I know your works. Remember those piercing eyes we saw in chapter 1, verse 14? Remember those feet of brass, judgment, and power we saw in verse 15 of chapter 1? He says, I know what's going on. Verse 19, this is actually the most commended church of all. Look at what he says. I know your works, I know your love, I know your service, I know your faith, I know your patience, verse 19 says. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. They were like a plane taking off from the airport. You know how it, it just is. He says, where you were is nothing compared to where you are now, and your trajectory is unbelievable. I mean, this is the most commended church. This church was doing more than at the beginning. They are growing in, in this whole list, in love, in service, in faith, in patience. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You know what that was? That's what everybody was doing. And if you lived in Thyatira, everybody kind of had a little something. I mean, they lived together for a while to see if it would work. They didn't get married they had parties, a little fun. I mean, you're supposed to do that, right? And this, this, you went to the temples and you had, got this meat. It was a deal. And see, a teacher came in. Notice what it says. Because you have this, this prophetess. They said that they're speaking from God and they teach and seduce my servants. They say, yes, I know it says that in the Bible. That's not what it means. We're under grace. God isn't that tight anymore. I mean, when he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father, mother, and cleave to a woman, it doesn't mean man and woman. It means something else. It means uh, you're loyal to your partner, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. And, and this whole re-explaining God to make people sin. And, and notice what it says. This person got right into the church. Now, whether Jezebel's a title or whether it's a person, it's what she did. She caused them to, to sin directly against what God said. And, and keep reading. And it says, I will give her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Verse 22, I'll cast her into a sickbed. And those, look at this, who commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, did you know God, Jesus is speaking and God's word is never leaving us in a vacuum what is all this sexual immorality, adultery and don't do that did that ring a bell in their minds did they, had they heard those words was Jesus reminding them of something in fact for a minute turn back with that thought to the book of James because when you turn back to James and that's the last place we're going because it's going to be time to go very soon James was probably the very first New Testament letter to get published and sent out. James was the brother, the earthly brother of Jesus Christ. Jesus had six brothers and sisters, four brothers and at least two sisters, maybe three. And so Jesus had these earthly brothers and sisters. They were Joseph and Mary's children. Joseph married Mary. Uh, they were not together. Jesus was virgin, born, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But after Christ's birth, Joseph became a wonderful husband and father with Mary, who became a wonderful wife and mother. And they had four sons and at least two daughters that are all mentioned and even named in the Gospels. James was probably the oldest boy. 
After Christ's resurrection, he came to faith. And he became such a magnificent, humble servant of the Lord that he arose before Paul, before the others, and became the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem, the big church. The one that had 3,000, the first service, get saved, and not too many days later, they had 5,000 more. So, I mean, they started out with 8,000. I mean, they were the first mega church, the first everything church. But James, most likely, when he wrote this in the 40s, was the first epistle that was circulated to the early churches. It was written by James, and he, he was very passionate as a pastor. I love this. I, I call the book of James authentic Christianity. I mean, he was so concerned about authentic Christianity. In fact, there are 108 verses in James. 108. 54 of them have commands. Remember what James remembered? James remembers what Jesus told the disciples on the mountain. He heard about it. He wasn't there probably. He wasn't a believer, but he heard about it. And Jesus said, teach them to observe all things that I have what you? Commanded. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So James, more than any other, his little epistles filled with commands. Well, look at chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 4, because we don't have time to do all 108 verses. We'll just do a few of them. And look how he starts verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. Wow. You mean these people were just flagrantly, blatantly, publicly wife swapping or something? What are we doing here? Then he defines it. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Interesting word. That word enmity is military warfare of two armies facing each other. Facing off head-to-head -head battle. It's not guerrilla. It's face-to-face -face clash. He said, if you choose to friend the world, you are choosing to face off with God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world, as if you didn't understand the first time I said it, James says, I will tell you again, you make yourself God's enemy. Aren't you glad James said that? I, I could never preach that right? That would be over the top. That would be, whoa, you can't say that. Or under grace, God, your enemy, what are you talking about? James clearly declares that spiritual adultery is, is by being friends once you're engaged to be married to Christ. If you go back after the former suitors before your engagement to Christ, which is salvation, if you go back to the old, it's enmity, it's fighting against God. So, look at verse 5. Now he talks about this, talk about unfriending. Now he's talking about the feed, you know, the, everything coming through your account. Do you think the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? You see, the Holy Spirit's watching the feed, you know, talking about Facebook. You know how it just everything, just all of your friends, all of their... Hi, I had a muffin. Yep, I had a muffin too, you know. You know I watched one, it had 25... I finally wrote at the bottom, and they couldn't believe it. i got to stop this because they didn't think. I mean, it just came on, and I saw it. It was so dumb. There were 25 between godly people, you know. And I finally said, how do you all have so much time to do this for all this time? I looked how many minutes that line of talking was going on Facebook. No more comments were in that column. That's all right. Talk about your muffin and what kind of jelly you had on it with the world and, you know, make sure you've read your Bible before, you know, so you can say, I've already read my Bible. But, um, but the feed of our life is what the Holy Spirit sees every day. He sees what's important to us, what we're looking at, what we're thinking about, what we're longing for, what we wish we could do and be. And that feed of our life, look at the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. You know what he's saying? Oh, Jesus, you died for this one, and there's, look at, look at world, 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 world. They have, they have all these f 
friendships with the world. I'm not talking about knowing unsaved people and loving them and sharing the gospel. I'm talking about loving what they do and wanting to do it too. Because what they do displeases God and we were saved to please God. And so we can't be wanting to be like them and conform to what they say is the way to live life. We say, no, I am separated from that and I am conformed to Christ. Now keep reading. But he gives more grace. You see, as the feed comes through of our life and it's displeasing the Lord, he gives us more grace. What does he give us more grace for? Do you remember Titus? Seems like we are in there for a whole year. We were. Do you know what it says? For the grace of God that saved us, verse 11 of 2, that bringeth salvation, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. The Lord ramps up, look what it says in verse 6, he ramps up the grace. Why? So we can not feel bad about what we're doing? No. So that we get the strength to unfriend worldliness. Not unfriend unsaved people. Unfriend our desire to allow that to teach us to enjoy sin. You see, if you're constantly watching movies that glorify sin, listening to music that that is either neutral or against God, constantly being entertained by humor that mocks people and their weaknesses and their disabilities and, and mocks at sin, that slowly conditions you to not think sin is so bad, to think maybe God's a little overboard, you know. Uh, and, and by being a friend of the world, it grieves the Holy Spirit within us. So therefore, look at verse 7. Here, here goes all these imperatives. How do, you, how do you unfriend worldliness? Verse 7. As if, you know, James is saying, you probably wonder what to do. So I'm going to tell you. And he gives 10 commands in a row. Remember Jesus said, teaching them to observe everything I commanded? James, more than anybody else, his little book follows the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. Earlier in chapter 4, he calls them murderers. The Lord said, if you're angry at your brother without a cause, you're like a what? A murderer. He says, if you look with desire, you're an adulterer. So James just picked up all this Sermon on the Mount stuff because it was his own brother and Savior and Lord. And so he compresses, starting in verse 7, all these commands. And he says, therefore, first command, submit to God. In other words, turn your life book account over to the Lord. And Lord, anybody you want, Anything in my life, just you can get rid of it. Number two, resist the devil and he will flee from you. All you have to do is start denying ungodliness. And it just, Satan is so used to moan over Christians that when one stands up, it just knocks him out. I mean, he is just a, a, a toothless lion devouring, you know, when we resist him. He has teeth when we are fearful and when we flee. Uh, from him and don't stand but but resist the devil's second command and he will flee from you verse 8 here's the third one draw near to God in other words as much as you're drawing near to everything else you like why don't you start going toward God be selective and aggressive go toward him draw near to God and God will draw near to you number four cleanse your hands you sinners do you remember when remember James was a Jew do you remember when priests were consecrated in the Old Testament that they would put out their right foot and they would put oil on their right big toe and then they would, they would turn and they'd put oil on their right earlobe and then they would pull out their hand and they would put oil on their right thumb. What was that about? Little sunscreen? You know, what are we doing here? It was everything, everywhere I go, I am going to go in the power of your spirit consecrated for you. Everything I take into my life that I listen to, everything that, that I'm putting and feeding in here is going to be consecrated by your spirit and everything I do, my, my thumb. And he says, you know what? Cleanse your hands. Give them back to me. Let me wash them and put oil on them of the spirit, you sinners. You have been choosing things that have made you enmity with God and enemies to God and, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 8 ends. He says, you have slowly gotten to the point where you're double-minded, where you say, boy, I know that God doesn't like that, but boy, it's so hard to give it up. Uh, but I know I should. And, and that double-mindedness makes us unstable in every part of our way. So he says, you need to cleanse your hands, number four, purify your hearts, number five. Look at verse nine. Lament. 
is number six. That's a command. Lament. Practice uh, taliporain. It's a word for an army without food and exposed to the ravages of stormy weather. James uses it as a call for voluntary abstinence from the luxurious life. He says, start self-denial. Start saying, you know, no Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no bunk. I'm going to deny myself till I, I'm going to lament the pathetic state spiritually I've gotten to. Uh, number seven is mourn. Start, start realizing that, that you've dishonored the Lord and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. You know what he said? You're so quick to know all the stuff you're excited about. Why don't you start being so aware of how much your life displeases the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't even want to get near doing that. And it all leads to the 10th one in verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Just fall before him. And fall before him and say what? Well, to unfriend worldliness, I have to avoid pleasure-dominated living. I'm not here to have a good time. I'm not here to be comfortable. I'm not here to, to have as, as cushy and as carefree and as, as delightful life possible. I am here to unfriend worldliness and to be the friend of God. And that's what the Lord said is the way that you please me and are fruitful. Now this morning, my pride prevents that from happening and, and, and so the Lord said this my expectation of you is that you love me most Ephesus that you separate from sin Pergamos and if you want to stay growing you got to start going through the feet of your life and blocking and unfriending everything that offends God that's what spiritual maturity is all about. We all learn each day more and more how to please God and how to stop displeasing him. It's two parts, active and withdrawing from things that displease him. And when we gather, that's what we gather for. You hear it from the word. You learn it in life groups. You learn it in small groups. You're held accountable to it by people that love you and say, you know what, you, you remember when you used to be around people that smoked? You know, it's passe to smoke, but do you remember when people used to be heavy smokers? They couldn't smell it. They would walk in acting like they didn't smell, smoke, and they would smell like an ashtray. Did you know smokers can't smell it? Christians living in the flesh can't tell it, but godly Christians can as much as someone, either they live with a smoker or they're a chain smoker, you smell it. You get in their car, <laughs> you know, go in their house. <clears throat> That's what spiritual life is like. And when we come to the church, we're all in God's recovery program and we're all at different places. And we come alongside and we say, you know what? You smell like the world. And I love you so much that I can't, you know, it's destroying your lungs, you know. You're going to get lip cancer. And that's what church is about. And it's uncomfortable. And certainly unsafe people don't like it. But it's what God designed so that all of us are fruitful fields. Let's stand together for a word of prayer. It's time to go. In fact, we're over time, so you can all be two minutes late next week. Um, you already were anyway, so, you, you know, I took it back. But uh, I'm teasing. But uh, this morning... When I pray, the elders come and they are here. If you have come and you're one of those really uncomfortable, you're not saved, they'd love to open the word of God to you. Or if you are so overwhelmed and feel so far from the Lord, you physically need to just have someone pray with you, over you, and for you. Otherwise, all of us are supposed to be ministering to one another. In fact, your greatest ministry starts this morning between here and your car. You've got to be looking to see how many people you can't avoid. And how many people you can say, wow, did that hurt as much as it did me? Did that bother you as much as it did me? Boy, let's pray for each other this week. See, this is where ministry begins right now. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that we would be, when you poke the diagnostic in, that we would be worshiping 
and fellowshipping and devotionally um, seeking after you and serving you people you bought us at an immense price and therefore we're supposed to serve you teach us more each day how to and help us to minister to one another in love prompted by your spirit in the precious name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said amen God bless you, you should go